the end of this uh, message today, uh, Pastor Kevin is going to ask a few questions, which we're going to answer publicly. But we are moving to the country of Costa Rica. Every new, every new Assemblies of God missionary in the United States that goes to South America or the Caribbean will have to spend one year in our school to learn what we call the six competencies of missionary service. And we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end. But this morning, I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 10. And I'm going to read a few verses beginning with verse 34. Acts 10, verse 34. And before I read that, I'd like to tell you a story about two men. Now, our message this morning is on two men, Peter and Cornelius, but I'd like to uh, begin with a story actually about another man, and his name was Bill. And this is such a relative story because Bill, this old guy in his cowboy hat, when he was a young man, told his pastor that he had a burden for the country of Guatemala. And the pastor said, well, Bill, you know, we're going to pray for you, but we don't have any funds to support you. But what if you took cases and cases of Bibles with you to Guatemala and sold them and then lived off the proceeds? Well, they both thought that was a good idea. And so Bill made the long, arduous trip to Guatemala. And while he was there, a young man, a Mayan Indian, said to him in Spanish, he said, Señor, if your God is so smart and so knowing, how come he doesn't speak our language? That was a Mayan Indian who didn't read Spanish. And so Bill began to seek the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gave him a creative idea that said, if you take the Spanish Bible and little by little you begin translating it into Mayan, the Mayans will receive the scriptures. And they did that in that Mayan dialect. And they did it again. And they did it again. And they did it again. And a few years went by and they did that in 50 different indigenous languages who got the Bible for the first time. And as the years went by, that number 50 multiplied to 500. And by the end of Bill, William Townsend's life, more than 5,000 languages had the scriptures in their own dialect. And that's why we call William Townsend a man who changed the world and founded the ministry called Wycliffe Bible Translators. And that's what we have today. And it all became because of a man named William and an unknown Mayan Indian, and they had an encounter. And in that encounter was the presence of the Holy Spirit who spoke life in creativity and solved a problem, and it changed the world. And along those lines, I want to read this morning for a few moments from Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse 34. The word tells us, so Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people 
and to testify that he is the one appointed by him, all the prophets, I'm sorry, and he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now listen and follow and look what happened. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized. So in the same way that William Townsend and this Indian man, and in a precise moment, the Holy Spirit dealt with them. And it changed the way we do missions. In this text, there was a man named Peter And he came face to face with another man named Cornelius. And it changed the way we do church today. Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to show us what we might not yet know. Give us what we might not yet have. And lead us to where we might not yet have been, we pray. In your name, amen. I want to spend just a couple of seconds on this story, starting with the vision that Cornelius had in verses 1 through 8. The Bible tells us that there was a man named Cornelius who was a very devout man. That means that he was dedicated, he loved to pray, and he was very generous, much like many of you here. And one day at a very specific hour, Cornelius says about three o'clock in the afternoon is praying. And all of a sudden, boom, an angel is standing in front of him. And Cornelius is stunned. And the angel says to him, Cornelius, all the praying and all the giving and all of your devotion, it's been noted in heaven. And I have been sent to give you a message. And you're to send some of your servants all the way to the town of Joppa and look for a man by the name of Simon Peter. And he's staying in this and this house by a guy who lives by the sea. And you call him. And you call him back to Joppa, to your town, because he has an important message to give you. And that's all it says. So he calls his servants forward and he sends them off. And the next day they walk all day and spend the night and walk the next day right up to the gate of the house where Peter is staying. Now, while they are walking that second day, Peter goes upstairs around noon and he's praying. And while he's praying, he says, you know, I'm hungry. So he calls downstairs, hey, can you fix something for me to eat? And while they were making his meal, Peter goes back to praying. And in a moment, boom, another vision comes now to Peter. And as Peter is praying, it says that he has this vision of this group of animals coming down from heaven. And he's trying to figure out what it means. And a voice says to him, Peter, kill one of those animals and eat it. And Peter responds, God, I've never eaten an unclean animal like that in my whole life. And the voice says, don't you dare call unclean what I have cleaned, cleansed. Now, kill an animal and eat it. And again, Peter is confused because Peter has spent his whole entire life making sure that he eats only that food which was considered to be clean according to his religion. And Peter says, God, no. Don't make me do this. And God says, don't you dare call unclean what I have cleansed. 
And a third time again, now kill one of the animals and eat it. And Peter begs him, saying, no, please don't make me eat something unclean. And God says, have I not told you now three times, don't call unclean what I have cleansed. And the vision disappears. And the Bible says that Peter is just standing there perplexed. Verse 17. And in that moment, there is a knock at the gate downstairs. And who do you think it is? The three men sent from Joppa to come get him. And when he hears the knock, the Holy Spirit says to Peter, go downstairs and you're to go with the men that I've sent. So he introduces himself. They come in, they spend the night, and the next day they walk. A long walk all the way back to Joppa where Cornelius is. They spend the night, they walk a second day. And finally they arrive at the house where Cornelius is staying. Now there's still a problem here. And that is that Peter still has issues. He's got doubts. I want to tell you a story about another missionary. Her name was Amy. Amy was raised in a very wealthy home. She had everything she needed for education. She was set even as a young lady. But Amy had a very difficult problem. Her dad died when she was young. And she grew up really having empathy for people who didn't have, or for young people who didn't have parents. And through that, God began speaking to Amy about children who were orphans. And Amy had a burden for a country, India. As a young lady, 24 years old, Amy said, I'm going to go to India. And I don't know what God has for me there. And she arrives in India, and for a whole year, Amy is trying to figure out what she is supposed to do in India. In the same way that Peter is with these men, trying to figure out what does all of this mean. Well, one day, Amy is in the street, and a young girl runs by and runs into her arms. They called her Pearl. And it turns out that orphans at that time in India were, were, were dedicated to what they called the temple service or the gods of the temple. And those children were then used in temple prostitution. And she recognized that God had sent her to India to rescue children off the street so they wouldn't be trafficked and used in temple prostitution. That young lady's name was Amy Carmichael. She spent 55 years in India rescuing children without one furlough. She never came back for furlough. She worked there for 55 years. She wrote 35 books on how God was using her to rescue children. But it wasn't until God showed her through the Holy Spirit what she was supposed to do. And in the same way in this text, Peter is walking with these men and he's still wondering, what is this vision with these animals and what am I, what am I supposed to be doing? And he gets to this man's house, Cornelius. And when he gets there, he realizes that when I step into this house, I'm going to be breaking a law. But he goes in and he says this, you know that it is against our law for me to be in this home. And Cornelius falls down and worships Peter. And Peter says, wait, 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 get up. He says, that, I know that's not what I'm here for. And he, Peter says to Cornelius, what's going on? And Cornelius recounts and says, you know, four days ago, an angel appeared to me and told me that you had something very special to tell me. And so I invited all of my friends and all of my relatives to our house today. And Peter says, I, I, 
I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. And Cornelius, this is, this, the words of Cornelius are so ironic. He says, well, here we are in the presence of God. Just tell us whatever he told you to tell us. So he sits down with all of those people. And it says, and then the light came on. Verse 34, and Peter begins preaching. And he says, you men, you Gentiles, you Greeks, you Italians, you soldiers, all of you know, all of you know what happened here in this area. How God sent a man named Jesus Christ and anointed him by the power of the Holy Spirit who went about doing good and healing sick and delivering all those who were oppressed by demons. And because of jealousy, he was crucified. But on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And this same Jesus is going to be the judge of the living and the dead. And in the moment that he says that, all of these people in Cornelius' house instantly are baptized in the Holy Spirit and begin speaking in tongues. And it says that Peter and his Jewish friends were stunned, speechless, which is ironic because they're speaking in tongues and the, the special people, they don't have a word to say. And then it sunk in. Peter says... God isn't playing favorites. God doesn't show partiality to anyone. God doesn't think one people are more special than others. God treats all of us the same if we have faith and fear him and are devoted to him. And God sees us when we pray and God hears us when we pray and God sees us when we're offering and God sees the kindnesses that we do. And in an instant, it changed the way church was done forever. And that's why Peter says, if, if the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to these people the same way it was given to us, quote unquote, Acts chapter 2, then what can keep them from getting baptized in water and become part of our church? And the answer is nothing. And it changed forever the way the gospel was preached, the places the gospel was preached, the people to whom the gospel was preached. I want to show you a picture about a very special tourist attraction. Some of you might think this is a great place to go on vacation. This, I, I could see, in fact, Kevin is right there. Do you see him? He's got that little, Pastor Kevin, I'm sorry. How many of you would find this to be an attractive place to go on vacation? Any takers? It, it kind of reminds me of what the great Yogi Berra said. He said, no one goes there. It's too crowded. <laughs> well, there might not be anyone in this place who'd want to go there for vacation, but there are obviously thousands of people there who want to go there on vacation. And we look at that and we wrinkle our noses and we go, that's dirty. That's disgusting. My first thought was, I can't imagine what the public restrooms look like. <laughs> but, that is the restroom. but <laughs> no, no. But look at that. Obviously, there are thousands of people who want to be there and find that to be pleasurable. But there are people like us who don't want to be a part of it. We might be very surprised how many people who are not like us would love to be a part of a fellowship like this one. But we either don't know how or how where we may not have a stomach for it. Now, friends, not all of us can go to other countries in the world 
And God is making sure somehow the countries of the world are coming to us. And we're going to have to make a decision. Do we want to do church the old way? The pre-baptism in the Holy Spirit? Or do we want to do church the new way? Post-baptism in the Holy Spirit that says no barriers. No barriers. There isn't a favorite, a second favorite, and a third favorite. God shows no partiality. And we look at all of the the different people that are coming to our nation, and I have one question. Who's responsible for preaching the gospel to them? We We are. But until the Holy Spirit reveals it to us that it is our place. And you see, Peter says it then for three verses, 17, 21, and 29. He couldn't wrap his mind around it. 17, 21, and 29, it says, and Peter still was confused. But it wasn't until he saw the baptism flowing through those people, the issue was settled. It changed the way we do church. The gift of the Holy Spirit changes the way we see people. And three times that voice said to him, kill and eat, kill and eat, kill and eat. And three times times Peter said, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's unclean, it's unclean, it's unclean. And three times the voice responds, don't you dare call unclean what I have cleansed. He wasn't talking about food. He was talking about people. The blood of Jesus brings forgiveness to the sin of any man or woman regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their skin color, their language, their place of birth, their custom, or their vacation choice. (laughs) The blood of Jesus is for all. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all. And here's how I'm going to land this thing. I want to just apply this simply with this one thought. Have you had the gift of the Holy Spirit change the way you see people in your life? Has the Spirit been poured out on you in such a way that you see people differently? That you treat them differently? Why not? Why not today? Why not today be open to the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he can use you? Hey, let's be honest. We can't witness or testify of anything that we ourselves haven't experienced. You You can't witness of the life-changing gift of the Holy Spirit if your life hasn't been changed. But when your life has been changed, you've got something to say. And as it was with Cornelius and Peter, and as it was with William Townsend and Amy Carmichael, I want to close with this story. In our 32 years of marriage, my wife and I have lived in the small town of San Andres, Guayapan, Oaxaca, Mexico, longer than any other town, eight years. 22 moves.
There's a man by the name of Abel. And I'm finishing with this. Because pastor told me we finish at 12. And I said, if I go over, what happens? He says, well, we take it out of your check. <laughs> and I said, if I finish earlier, do you add to the check? He goes, no, we don't do that around here. So I'm either right at 12 or it's over, baby. So, so there's a man named Abel. He's a friend of mine. The man works like a dog. And you know what I mean. Before the sun comes up until the sun sets he can do a thousand things. The problem is Abel drinks everything that he earns. He's got nothing left. And one day Abel drove his truck off the side of a ravine and walked away from it. And Sunday afternoon, the spirit prompted me and said, go to Abel's house. Today is his day. And I hollered up to Alona. I don't holler at her much, but I, that day I said, I'm going to Abel's house. I walked up to his house, knocked on his door. Within 20 minutes, Abel says, I need Jesus to save me. And with a sincere heart, he invited Christ to be his Lord and Savior, and his sins were forgiven. For two years, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Abel would study the Bible. For two years and hasn't touched a drink since. He was changed by the power of God. Right. Now that's a white American bringing the gospel to a Zapoteco Indian. And that's only because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to use you but you have to be filled. You have to know his gift. You have to experience that. If Peter needed it, and Cornelius needed it, and Pastor Kevin needed it, and Mike Hattinger needed it, you need it. We all need it. Because it will not only give us the power, but it will give us a new way of seeing people. And with that, I close. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to minister to these people. Lord, I pray that something said this morning would bring change and transformation. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to pull on. Before, before we pray for them, I... This was a different message, much different. Holy Spirit's talking a little different in this room right now. And um, I just want to, I want to capitalize on it, okay? If the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all the power of the Holy Spirit was good enough for the disciples on the day of Pentecost, if it was good enough for Cornelius and his household, and Acts chapter 2 says that this gift is available to all who call upon the name of the Lord our God, as many as the Lord our God shall call, this Pentecostal experience is available to you as well. Everybody. I don't care whether you're weirded out by what culture has done with it over the past 150 years or not. I don't care about that. I'm talking to you about a scriptural principle and a scriptural truth. There is an experience called the baptism in the Holy Spirit that can change the way you view the world. And this experience is available to you if you will simply ask. I was reading the scriptures the other day. God gives the Holy Spirit without limit. Wouldn't you like to? Come on, that's in John chapter 3, I believe. Wouldn't you like to have the Holy Spirit without limit, the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Jesus who went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because the power of the Spirit was with them. Wouldn't you want that same Spirit active in your life to make an impact on your family, your world, your finances, your life? Wouldn't you like that same power of the Holy Spirit available in you? Would you? All right, then let's just... Right now, as an act of prayer, can you just turn your hands up? 
just like this. And would you pray a simple prayer with me? And the prayer goes something like, I don't care, God, what I do. I don't care what happens. All I know is that there is more of you. As Apollos was told, they were explained the way of God more accurately. And there is a more accurate way of following you, and that is in the power of the Spirit. So right now, with my hands up and my heart open, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Renew us, empower us, baptize us with the fullness of your Holy Spirit and power. And God, we lay aside all the cultural expectations and all that kind of stuff. We simply say, God, if you got it, I want it. I am open. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and power. Do miracles in this room right now. Some of us, we face problems we cannot solve on our own. Right now, in the name of Jesus, the same Jesus who went around doing good, doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray for healing in this room. We pray for changes of, of attention and direction. We pray for restoration and healing and, and hearts to be open and provision to be given. The miracles would flow from heaven right now into this room, into this space as we trust the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us. And if you're not open to that, I ask you right now just to open up your heart and say, Jesus, be my Lord. I'll do, I will receive whatever you say. I will follow you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We're going to pray for these guys. Before we pray for them, I want to, I want to ask them a couple of questions. Listen, listen, one more thing. Because let me be pastor for two seconds, okay? You do not pray that prayer, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit once. Because on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says the next chapter, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the next chapter, it says they were filled with the Spirit. Am I correct? The, over and over and over again. So tomorrow when you wake up, why don't you pray a little prayer with me? This is a prayer I pray nearly every day of my life. Father, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit today and use me to build your kingdom? Fill me with the Holy Spirit today. It'd be a good thing every morning instead of waking up and saying, good Lord, it's morning, say good morning, Lord, right? Wouldn't it be better to have a good morning, Lord attitude? You roll out of bed, you ask for his power to help you today. So every day when you wake up, would you, would you turn your heart toward God? Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. If one of these days when you say, fill me with the Holy Spirit, you don't become one of these crazy tongue-talking Pentecostals. It might happen to you. And if it does, it's within the Bible. Is it in your Bible? It's in mine all over the place. So don't be all freaked out about it. And don't get all weird out about it. We're not shoving you down your throat or drinking Kool-Aid or anything. We're just simply trying to tell you there's a power available to you. Be open to stepping into that power. Right? Is that fair enough? I hope that's fair, right? Because if God gives it, great. Yeah. All right. Now we get to pray for these guys before we pray for them. How many of you are going to pick up tomorrow and go move to Oaxaca, Mexico? You are good. Go. You, you volunteered. God's calling into missions right here. Be careful. God might take you guys up on that. Yeah. There'd be worse things in your life. But you're probably not going to go move to Mexico tomorrow or Costa Rica, right? You probably aren't going to do that, right? But yet these guys are. And they're going to live there and they're going to affect every missionary in a Spanish-speaking country in South America is going through your leadership. Wow, that's a big responsibility, isn't it? So how do you pray for a missionary? How do you pray for a missionary? Well, since you can't go, I think you can go. You know, it's not fair for you to hear the gospel a thousand times and for somebody else to never hear it once. So we need to do something about it. And I was reading in Romans years ago and it said that we can literally join our missionaries in, in their struggle by praying to God for them. So literally, I can go to Oaxaca, I can go to Costa Rica when I join alongside these missionaries by praying for them. How do you pray for them? Well, there are a couple of things I think you should pray. Number one, for provision. Um, you're obviously getting incredibly rich as missionaries, right? Whatever you say, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so you've got to travel around and raise money, and it's difficult raising money and all that stuff. Am I correct? We do have to travel. We do have to travel and raise funds. That's correct. All missionaries have to raise funds, and that's always something hanging over your head. Am I correct? If we if we didn't need, we wouldn't be here. So that's why. And, and these guys are not getting super duper rich, so we could pray for provision, right? We could pray for them to be provided for, so that they aren't dying chasing a few dollars, they could actually get back to the ministry they need to do, right? All right, second thing is, uh, I like to pray um, for God to protect them. Have you ever run into a circumstance or two that you guys needed some protection? Okay, so yes, um, first of all, Every house that we've lived in, we've been broken into, but the Lord has protected us. It's still not a good feeling knowing that, you know, people are carrying your stuff out, but the Lord has protected us. Um, also, you know, people always ask us, oh, in Mexico, have you run across cartels? Absolutely. Several times our lives have been threatened. One time in particular, Mike was teaching a Bible study in a home for men, and the talk came up about, you know, drugs and alcohol, and of course, Mike answered biblically. And afterwards, the owner of the house said, we had cartel members here, and if you ever speak against that again, you'll be dead before you get to the car. Well, he doesn't back down from preaching the Bible, and he's still alive. And by the way, I didn't mention this first service, but the hitman got saved. So. <laughs> the hitman got saved. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. So, I mean, if every house you'd ever lived in had been broken in, would you want somebody to, 22 different houses, everyone been broken into? Would you want somebody praying for you to be protected, right? You, you got pulled over by cops. I've heard this story too, the police before, but just 10 seconds. In, in Mexico City, we were pulled over by fake police, escorted to a cartel uh, center, which was in the center of a junkyard. And I sat in front of a cartel boss a man had to weigh about 400 pounds with gold hanging off his neck. And he said, how much you got? And I said, I have an, a Gideon's Bible and $40. And I laid it in front of him and got up and walked out. And they followed me. And when I got out to the street, my buddy was sitting in the car listening to music. And I pounded on the window, said, let's get out of here as fast as we can. <laughs> Would you want somebody praying for you for protection at that moment too, right? All right. And then the last thing is I pray for, we pray for power that power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus, who did do miracles all throughout his ministry. You guys have seen some miracles. You wanna tell me a couple of them? Okay, so there is another miracle um, that the Lord provided. Lord told me to do a service, a special service for women. And in this area, everyone I mentioned that, I said, God is telling me to hold a special um, preaching service for women. Everyone says, can't be done. It's not done here. You can't do that. And I said, but God told me. So, but the whole time I was giving, getting pushback. Well, I did it anyway. The problem was I found a place to rent, but I didn't have enough chairs. And there was no place I can go rent chairs. And again, I prayed and I said, Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord said this to me. He says, find as many chairs as you can and I will fill each one. So I started knocking on doors. I mean, we gathered our chairs. I started knocking on doors. We were gathering chairs. And I managed to find 52 chairs. The day of the service comes, and how many women came? 52 women. That was a miracle. And the most personal miracle to me was we were planning an evangelistic outreach in a central park. There were going to be four people groups there. The day before, I get violently sick. My wife takes me to the hospital. The doctor says, you have typhoid. And my wife began communicating with our supporting churches. I'm sure Harvest was there. And overnight, God instantly healed me from typhoid. from typhoid. The next morning, I woke up completely refreshed and healed, and we were able to do the campaign. From typhoid. Now, I could, I, we're, this summer, we're going to try to keep our services to a direct time period. And you know what? Um, you guys could probably tell me stories all day long that would blow our mind. But I want you to know that the 22 years of our financial support and all the prayers we pray, we're a part of everything they're doing. We are joining them in their struggle. 
So would you join me in their struggle right now for praying for protection, for provision, and for the power of the Holy Spirit. And last of all, I pray for this one, for the presence of God to be so real on your life that everywhere you go and everything you do, the presence of God would be there as a constant companion and friend and comfort. And by the way, that's a great thing to pray for us too, right? All right, Jesus, we pray right now for Mike and Lona that you would fill them with that Holy Spirit and power. God, they've uh, been given the opportunity to impact the world. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would just move upon them, that you would empower them with the Holy Spirit, that same Jesus that was raised from the dead, that did miracles. Would you do miracles through them in the name of Jesus? Would they see supernatural miracles taking place and lives being changed and, and, and people being healed and blind eyes open, deaf ears opened and, and uh, people delivered from alcohol and their lives being turned around and God, all those different things. God, would you just begin and it, it continued that power in their life. Would you provide for every financial need and every emotional and spiritual need, provide for them, be the God of their provision. Would you be also the God of their protection and would you keep them from harm? God, I know things are gonna hurt them, but I pray in the name of Jesus, they would be protected from harm and their lives would be protected within the hollow of your hands. And we ask in the name of Jesus, you to do this and to be with them always and be with us as we follow you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, everyone.